One of the more important things I need y'all to know about chemistry is that chemistry is not a subject that you memorize. Really. See, I say the same thing for physics, actually. Because once you get into the habit of memorizing your science concepts, you don't really understand it. You will never do very well in the exam. You know, it's like, you know, you think like you're some like memory, like computer bank, you just take in information, then you vomit out, right? I think bio to a certain extent can. Chemistry, you need to apply the concepts. So we try to stray away from memorizing anything. We always try to build the understanding. It takes a bit longer to mem understand than to memorize. But in the long term, it's better for you. Now, I do not know how far you guys have taught, but if you are knowing that, okay, I most likely want to go JC kind. All the more, you shouldn't memorize anything because you need to build your foundation properly. So O-level, the foundation is for you to succeed at A-level as well. So I know a bit far because like, you're not even close to O-level yet, but I think you need to see the big picture here. Okay, so later as I'm going through, I will deliberately slow down to get you all to understand certain parts. Okay, and those will really help you in the long run. Now, um, we have another one more minute before we get started. So later on when we do more concept, uh, I want you all to focus a lot on the way you do the question, the step by step. Okay, so I'll go through what those steps are. After today, uh, if you really want to make an impact to your learning, go and do more questions. I think most of your school make you all buy your topical TOS already. If you haven't go popular to buy, it's like what, $10 or some shit. It's affordable one. Uh. But more concept is one of those chapters you need to practice. You can think of it as like the math of chemistry. Yeah. So after today, whatever you learn, uh, you must go practice. And the magical thing about more concept is this. The moment you get it, you get it already. There's nothing to memorize. Really. So a lot of my own students, because I only take set course. Uh, so my, they come in like you all like that, a bit blah, blah, uh, then... We start, right? Normally, more concept become one of their strongest topic by the time they take O-level. It's because they didn't memorize anything. They know exactly how to do the steps. Okay? So, I'll show you the magic later, but you all need to promise me to not memorize too much. Okay? We understand it. Okay? And I guess that is how you really achieve the A1. Hey, Zizhong, is, are, you, are you the Zizhong that I know or is it like a Zizhong that I do not know? Oh my god! Ah. Okay, for context, I play floorball. So I'm in a floorball cup. And this Zizong is like my teammate. Yeah, Zizong, what's up? Oh, it's in sec 3. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so too much information, TMI. So I play floorball. I used to be from Cat High. Then I play, play, play. Then we have a club, la, right? So I'm like the old guy in the club, la, the retiree. Because we got Div 1, Div 2. So I used to play in Div 1. Then I'm like, I just want to enjoy life now and not be so competitive. So I'm playing Division 2. So Division 2, we also take in youth players for development. So it's as well like the youth player that we're bringing. Yeah, okay, anyway, anyway, I'm a camp teacher, not a global player right now. Okay, so let's officially get started. Uh, I need to do my standard introduction. So if you all have heard it before, I'm sorry, you need to hear it again. But hey, welcome to Sec 3 Chemistry. Okay, this session too, uh, so the topics that we cover in session 1 is different. I think by now, some of you that have attended multiple sessions maybe had a chance to see the other tutors in action as well. So overall, as a team, you can see we are quite young, uh, but we want to make sure you guys understand uh, We might I might look young, but actually I teach for nine years already. Okay, because I thought the moment I finished my A-level in the army, I started teaching. So I technically took O-level like nine times already. I'm like sick of the whole thing already. It's like the whole syllabus, I know it inside out. I'm then bored of it, but... As long as you guys are learning, it's fine, okay? But that's our team. Um, you are here currently at the Serangoon branch. Uh, we also operate at a couple of other locations. So we're at Bukit Ima. We are also at East Coast and Parkway. Uh, right now, you are at Serangoon Central, which is right near next. But I know some of you don't stay in this vicinity, but we also have classroom spaces. That means we do conduct group tuition at Topayo, at Jurong East, as well as Woodlands. In fact, for the East East, we are looking at an upcoming space in Tampanese. So I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find a branch or a location that's nearer to you. Because for us, we prefer teaching you in person. I want to see you, you know. Uh, I know some of you are okay with the online. Uh, we also do hybrid, but we much prefer if you can come down. It's also easier. You know, sometimes I teach some students online. Then you're always off camera one, right? Nobody on camera one, right? Then I can teach them the whole year, right? I never see their face before. They're like, oh yeah, sure. They're like, then like, when I finally meet them, right, after the exam, they're like, who are you? They're like, I'm here. Like, oh yeah, I've been teaching you for a year. So I always like it in person. Like, but of course, a hybrid option for flexibility at times. So this is me, this is me. Okay. So I've been teaching for nine years already. Uh, the interesting fact about me is that I only teach sec fours. I don't teach sec threes at all. So uh, you guys are sec three, but you're going to sec four. Uh, the reason why I only like to teach sec four is because I like that desperateness. I need a little bit of like the, oh shit, this O-level is coming. 
then you know that motivation is there, then it's easier to push out as well. Okay. Um, so that's me. Um, I mainly teach chem and physics only. I don't teach anything else. Um, I've been teaching for quite a while. Last year I had about 90 students. Uh, but I can proudly say lah, the majority of them did very well. Uh, but here's the secret about why they do well. I grind them very hard. So right now my sec boss, uh, next door, some of them are my students, right? Per week, right? They are doing two TOS. So yearly paper, they are doing two papers. So throughout the year, part of the program, before they sit for their prelim, they do about 13 prelim papers, week on week. So there is no secret to doing well. It's just consistent hard work. Yeah. So in case you are thinking of signing up for tuition, I want your first is going to be a grind. But I can promise you, you will produce results. Lah. But there's no shortcut. We need to do the work long. Okay. So I believe in that. And that usually translates to very good results, which is why closer to 65 to 70% of my students get A1 or A2. A1, A2, I can't really control. Lah. Depends on your on that day performance. But safety in that range. So you imagine there's 10 of you sitting here. At least 7 of you will get A. Uh, that's what I can promise. Even if you come in at an F9, it's possible. But you need to do the work. Okay. Um, a bit more about myself out of teaching because I'm a human being as well. I'm not, not just a tutor. Okay. Like I said just now, I play floorball. Um, I follow K-pop since long time ago. So I bet you I know my K-pop knowledge is deeper than yours. But the newer groups, I don't really stand anything anymore. Lah, all right. And I also play games in my downtime. So if you want to add me on Mobile Legends, sure. Uh, currently, I think I'm a like, legend or something. Too long didn't play already, but I usually play after the exams. Because when my sec boss go for an exam, I feel like I go for an exam as well. So I don't play with uh, until I finish my exam. Okay, but what about chemistry? What are we doing today? So I need to make it clear. For sciences, right, concepts. You need to get the concept. Okay, there is no memorizing to be done. You understand the concept. Now, of course, there will be some misconceptions. That means you think, oh, this is supposed to be like that. But in reality, it's not. So I'll try to address some of the common misconceptions as well. Things that you are easily mistaken. And later on, right, for the work example, this is one of the most important things for more concept. Step by step. How to do it, why you need to do it. So we're going to use actual questions instead of just talking in theory. And then we'll take a look at commonly tested questions. I am not a believer of studying content without question. It's always concept, we apply it, concept, we apply it, until you get it. All right. And lastly, we will talk about some answering techniques when needed. This is a bit more relevant for Redox. Because redox oxidation state, right? There's a specific way to write it. So we will talk about everything of these four topics. So we're doing more concept, acid bases, sorts and QA. And in the last half an hour, we'll be tackling redox. Okay. So I know some of you might not have redox in your end of year, but no harm listening to it. Lah. It'll be your exposure. Okay. It's so much useless. Let's go. Ready? Okay. So let this be the most productive two hours ever. I promise you, if you listen, you will learn a lot, okay? And a lot of these things your teacher in school won't teach you one, okay? This is based on purely my experience teaching. I know what works, what doesn't. Now, we start with more concept first. So for those of you who haven't downloaded the worksheet, head over to our Telegram channel, go and download. There is a student copy where without the answers, and then there's an answer key. So the answer key is provided, so don't be too desperate to copy. Listen. Listening is a bit more important now. Okay. How do you normally approach more concept? The truth uh, is you just think that sure, this chapter is all formula. Uh. Memorize the formula, can you? But the problem here is that yes, we do need the formulas. Most of the formula, I don't even have to explain to you. You probably get it, right? Like how to find uh, more, more equals to mass over MR. These kind of basic things, I think you already know. But I think what's more important here is when you get a question, can you solve it? So the formulas, I'm going to say, you need to know. But don't expect me to read it out for you because this one, you look at it, you get it. Let's focus more on how to do questions. All right? That one is something that you cannot learn by reading the notes. So what I'm saying is everything here, the formula must know. But let's apply it. That's the way you strengthen your understanding. So I'm going to go over to this document called the curated notes. This is just like our textbook. I, I call it the Bible. Lah. Um, because it has everything that you need to know. But I'm just going to use some examples from here to teach. Huh? So I'm going to start directly with the way we do more concept. And this is the one that I need you to fully absorb. I'm going to repeat it twice because how important it is. For almost any more concept question, there's exactly four steps you need to take to solve it. Okay, four steps. What are the four steps? Step one, write the balance equation. Sometimes you're in luck, the question will give you the equation. But if the question doesn't give you the equation, you must write out your own balance equation. 
Yes, you could say that Cher, I'm not very good at creating the balance equation. That's fine. It will come in time. But you need to know this has to be your opening step. Question give that. Question don't give, you create your own. Okay, now some of the simpler ones that you can see here, even for this example, this is a metal plus acid reaction, which I met most of you already know. It gives you salt and hydrogen gas. So where I'm coming from is that for any more concept question, you need chemical equation. Must. That's your step one. I'll explain to you why you need it later. But this is how you should be doing it. Now, this chapter is called what? More concept. Stoichiometry. More concept. Step two, what do you need to do? Calculate more. Law. Now, there's various ways we can calculate more. And the reason why I say that is because you can find mass over MR to get more. Sometimes you can use the volume to derive the mole. But regardless of what you do, your second step would be to calculate the number of mole based on what the question provides you with. So if you take a closer look at what is being provided to us, we were told that there's 48 grams of magnesium metal. So in your head, you should be thinking, hmm, I got mass. But do I mass? Huh? What I want is mole. So how do I turn mass to mole? The correct formula to be applying here is mass divided by MR. MR, you can easily go over to the periodic table to find it. The MR of magnesium is 24. It's the number, right? So you just take mass divided by MR. I have successfully calculated the number of mole of my magnesium to be 2 mole. Step 1 done, step 2 done. Equation, step 2 calculate mole. Now, the function of step 1 and step 2 is to allow you to eventually do step 3. This is one of the harder steps. So listen, uh, understand this, uh, more ratio. But what is more ratio? More ratio refers to, based on the balanced chemical equation, how many more to how many more? What does it mean? Let's take a look at magnesium. I know magnesium in front got no number, uh, but theoretically, right, is one. You get what I mean? If I don't put anything, it's one. Uh. The number in front of HCl is two. So the more ratio here is one is to two. But this question itself, what I'm trying to find, uh, the question is asking me to find the volume of hydrogen gas. So right here, I have magnesium. I got magnesium. Uh. I want to find hydrogen. Magnesium, hydrogen. So I have the number or more of magnesium. I'm going to compare it with what I want to find. I want to find hydrogen. So I compare magnesium and hydrogen. Now. I go like, okay, one magnesium will give me one hydrogen. Okay, got it. How many magnesium do I have? I've got two. Ma. So if I have two magnesium, I will get two hydrogen. That is comparing more ratio. I repeat one time. Huh? Equation. Equation in front got the numbers, right? When you balance. That is your more ratio. You will compare what you have found in step two with what you want to find. The question wants me to find hydrogen. I do not know how many moles of hydrogen I have. But what I do know is the number of moles of magnesium. So I compare magnesium with hydrogen. One is to one. So if I reacted two moles of magnesium, I will have two moles of hydrogen. And in the last step, you solve for what the question is asking you for. They're asking me for the volume of hydrogen gas. So one mole of any gas, you have seen in the formula, one mole is 24 dm cubed. So if I have two moles of hydrogen, two times 24, my volume of hydrogen gas produced is 48. So if I go from top to bottom, balance chemical equation, find mole, compare mole ratio, solve for the answer. The question can be more complex than this. Fair game, right? This is a work example. It's easy, right? But the steps are the same. Even at SEC 4, when you go for O level, it is this same four steps that you'll be doing. My, my SEC 4 that took their prelim, this is exactly the four steps. So it's a matter of whether you want to learn it now or you learn it down the line. No? The earlier you learn it and the earlier you're able to apply it, the better. Now, if you want to take photo or anything, I'm okay. So you can go and take photo, screenshot. It's all cool with me as long as you're learning. Okay, so these four steps, eventually you need to keep applying them. With practice, it gets a bit better. So like I said, I don't want to delete daily too long on this part. Okay, let's focus on trying to solve real questions. So in the worksheet itself, I prepared some different types of questions. Let's approach them together. Okay, so let's go over to the worksheet now. Let's take a look at this question. Not easy, huh? but we're going to do it together. Let's recall together what's step one. 
step one is your balanced chemical equation, right? Life is great, right? They give us already. So step one done. Yeah, then we do together. What is step two? Do you all still remember? Yeah. Calculate more, right? Okay, now, this is going to be a bit more complicated because it's not going to be that easy. But let's understand that in step two, my job is to calculate more. Now, more of what? Uh, we need to see what the question gives us. Okay, what they have given us is that they say it is 300 cm cube of N2O4. So what we can find uh, is the number of mole of N2O4. Because they give me this, uh, I just need to change volume to mole. But how? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, one more, uh, in case you all don't know, the revision here is that one mole is 24 dm cube. But how uh, you need to take note of the unit. Uh, this is cm cube, right? So one mole is also the equivalent of 24,000 cm cube. Same, same, la. it's just units here. So in other words, if I want to find out how many mole is 300 cm cube, we are supposed to take 300 cm cube divided by 24,000 cm cube. And this will give me my number of mole. I'm sorry, I don't have a calculator. <laughs> 0 0.0125. Thank you so much. Step two done. Halfway there already. Okay, so first step, uh, we just calculate more. You will need to use your formula, uh, but I'm saying the application here is more important. Step three, this is the most difficult one. Right, do you still remember what is step three? Very good. We compare more ratio. Hear me out. Uh, I compare more ratio with what I have found with what I want to find. What I have found is N2O. So let's write down N2O4. What do I want to find? What am I trying to solve for in this question? I want sodium hydroxide, right? So I should compare what I found in step two with what I want to find, which is sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is my NaOH. Now, based on the chemical reaction, right, the chemical equation, what is the mole ratio of my N2O4 with my NaOH? can see here, right, based on the equation, it is 1 is to 2. Here, this one. That is why we need a chemical equation in the first place. You don't have chemical equation, you cannot compare the mole ratio. So all the steps are necessary. You cannot skip any step. Okay? Now that I know for every one mole of this, I will need to react with two moles of this. I have found the number of moles here to be 0 0.0125. In other words, how much sodium hydroxide would it react with? Times 2 long. So this one here will be 0 0.025. Almost there, almost there. Final step, we solve for what the question is asking us. So what the question wants us to find uh, is volume of sodium hydroxide. What I have is I have concentration. I got concentration. I also have more. More concentration, I'm supposed to find volume. What is the equation that we can use? Concentration equals to more divided by volume. Right, this is the formula. So if I want to find volume, what do I do? We have to take more divided by concentration. It's just rearranging it, it's just a formula. Okay, so in the final step, step four, what I'll need to do is I need to find volume. I can do so by taking my number of mole divided by concentration. Number of mole I have found is 0 0.025. Concentration is, they told us, 1.5. I do not have calculator, but I think your final answer should be 0 0.02 dm cube which is the equivalent of 20 cm cube. And yes, that's for guess. Uh, so we can divide the N204 by the 24,000. All good? No, the number's off, is it? I don't have my calculator, so you'll need to tell me. 0.016. Huh? Again, again. So you need a round up, is it? In this volume required. Yeah. Wait, uh, let me double check the, the concentration then. But the steps are definitely correct. Uh. Is it whether we had any numerical numbers? 
in times two divided by four. Yeah, so least number long, correct. So you need to, if the minimum we need, sorry, that means now here I cannot write this, my bad. The minimum we need is 16.7 cm cube. So you need to use at least 20. La. You cannot use 10. Okay, so that's the exact value you're supposed to get. This one, not this one, sorry. Okay, you should be getting 0 0.01666666. Yeah. So minimum you need 16 cm cube. Meaning I should be using at least 20. Okay, but I guess what I'm trying to impress upon you, I don't really care about the answer, honestly, is whether you can see the four steps. This one, you won't get it in a heartbeat one. You need some time. But this has to be the way moving forward, even in the future when you do more concept. Okay, so do the practices. I included more than I will be going through so that you guys can practice. But take note, uh, this is not the only question type, which is why it makes more a bit more challenging. This is your standard four step. It's about 70% of the questions that will come up. So this is actually the most important. But there are also other question types I need to give you exposure to. So let me talk about the other question types as well. This one is a concept that is quite important. The concept that is being tested here is what I call limiting slash excess. Now, how do we go about thinking of limiting and excess? Just understand that when we do reaction, we cannot always expect that all of the reactants will fully react. Because sometimes, you know, you might accidentally add a little bit more than the other one you didn't add as much. So they will never fully react. That is just idealistic. So in the real world, there will always be something in excess, something that's too little. Let me give you an example. So let's say in a car factory, okay? In a car factory, to make one car, don't laugh at my drawing, okay? This is the best I can do already. One car body and four car wheels. That makes one car. So in terms of a chemical reaction, we can think of it this way. In the factory, I have one body. I need to have four car wheels. That will form one full car. So in a way, the more ratio is like one is to four. Okay, let's say right now uh, in my factory, uh, I always use the same. I got four car bodies. I got 12 wheels. What is the maximum amount of car I can form? Three or four? Three? I thought I got four car body. Not enough wheels. Let that sink in. Uh. I might have enough car bodies, but I don't have enough wheels. Because I need a set of four. Uh. 4, 8, 12. I can only form 3 cars. Now, what am I trying to tell you here? My car body is in excess. I got too much. I got one extra one. That one I want to form a car also cannot. I ran out of my car wheel already. So what is the limiting me from producing more cars? Why I cannot produce more? I got not enough car wheels. So in this case, the car wheel is the limiting reactant is preventing me from producing more cars. Limiting. Excess, limiting. Excess, too much. Limiting, not enough. I wish I had more. If I had more, I could have produced more. So the whole concept of limiting and excess, don't make it more complicated than it has to be. The one that is too much is just excess. Ah. The one that I fully used up, ah, that means I'll use up everything, fully used up, is the one in X, uh, is the limiting. Sorry, the one that got too much is excess law. Nothing to memorize, right? You just need to understand in theory how it works. The reason why I like to use this example is because some of us have a bit of a misconception. We have four car bodies, 12 car wheels. Some of you are like, four smaller. Ma. Small is limiting. Oh. Not correct. You must always compare it to the more ratio. That's why the equation is the basis of more concept. Without the equation, just by purely looking at the numbers alone, you cannot determine what is limiting, what is excess. That's a misconception. Okay, so it doesn't mean you have less of it is limiting. You need to, based on the more ratio, look at it in that sense. That is how you do excess and limiting. The bad news about limiting and excess is that it has a, it will affect one of your set four topics, rate of reaction. So if you don't learn this well here, right? When you do rate of reaction, you're going to suffer. So more concept is a bit of a foundational thing. So you have to learn it well in sec 3. Lah. Otherwise, in sec 4, you're going to struggle. Okay? So this is how we think about limiting and excess. But I say so much, I haven't even solved the question. So let's take a look at the question here. So the question says that hydrogen can react with oxygen to form water. Okay, cool. No problem. So we started with 30 cm cube of hydrogen and 30 cm cube of oxygen. Now, 
I'm going to rewrite the equation down. 2H2 plus, I'm going to write 1, O2, to give me water. They said that I started with 30 cm cube here and 30 cm cube here. Let me give you an exam technique that's very helpful. The moment you see the question is phrased like that, total volume of gas that is left, normally this word left implies that we are looking at a question where there is limiting and excess. Left over. I got too much of it. So when you see a question with the phrasing total volume of gas remaining, total volume of gas left, you know it is a limiting and excess question already. Very popular end of year reading question. O level, not so much, but in school exam, they like to test this a lot. Now, how do we then solve this question? Take note, uh, the more ratio here is 2 is to 1. What does this mean? For every 2, I only react with 1. Let me write down the numbers for you straight away. If I use up all 30 cm cube, how much will I use up here? 2 is to 1. If I react 30, down here I will react 15, exactly. And what is a conclusion you must be able to make here? There will be 15 cm cube in excess. You get what I mean? The question type, this is not the four steps already. This is by comparing more ratio, you determine limiting and excess. It is quite similar to the car body example. But understand this, uh, nothing to memorize here, understand it. So the question is asking, what is the total volume of gas that remains? in excess is 15 cm cube of oxygen. Now, some of you that are thinking a little bit faster might ask me this. Sure, what about the water that we produce? Do we need to count that in? If 30 reacted with 15, by right, how much do I produce? 2, 1, 2. 30, 15, I will produce 30 cm cube. But here's the catch. The volume is measured at room temperature and pressure. At room temperature and pressure, water is a liquid. The question is asking about volume of gas. So the water, I don't care. That's it. Sometimes uh, you do produce a gas, uh, you need to calculate that in terms of the total volume of gas remaining. So the question type will differ. There's a bit of variation here and there. But this is another question type on top of the four steps. Right? Easy? I don't think it's that easy. Lah. But with practice, it gets a lot better. Because after a while, you realize they are all same pattern. Right? It's just which one excess, which one is limiting. Okay, so right now we have covered two question types. Huh? The four step one, the excess limiting one. There is still more. Lah. So let's continue a bit further. I like question three a lot. Let's take a look at question three together. This one is going to pack a punch. So follow me closely. The good news is that this question, we can still solve it using the four steps. But there's an additional catch. Because this question has the term percentage purity. Wow, oh, jala already. You all know what's the formula for it. But we can always go back and refer, right? What's the formula for percentage purity? Over here, mass of pure sample over mass of sample. Now, what does this mean? It means that in the whole thing, there are some impurities. So the remaining 90% is my pure compound, 10% is impurities. Lah. Okay, so percentage purity simply helps you determine how much is, of it is real stuff, how much of it is rubbish. Okay, do I have a better example? Uh, don't have, I don't have any good analogy in my mind. But if I think of any, we'll talk about it. Okay, so it's never 100% pure. It's always like 90, 80, 70, 50% pure. But here's more important, how to do question, right? That is what you'll be encountering in an exam. For me, I always like to write down the formula at the side, so I have a bit of a reference. I always like to write down this. For percentage purity, as a direct reference, right, is always pure substance over, I like to call it impure mixture times 100%. Now, this question is not easy, but we should still employ the four steps, step by step, to try to solve it. It has to be your thought process. But good news, step one, done, equation given. Fantastic. Do you still remember what is step two? Calculate more, right? But there's a problem now. Why? Wait, we got two numbers. Do I use 900 or do I use 102? 
that will be the problem you'll face for eternity until you hit sec four O level. But there's a very definite way to think about this. Okay. Now, just know that when you're doing this question, whether we use uh, 900 or 102 depends on this formula here. Mm -hmm. My job uh, is to calculate the mass of the pure sample. What the question has to give you is the mass of the impure mixture. Let that sink in again. Uh. You are supposed to calculate the pure. Question will give you the impure mixture. Why is that always the case? Because if the question doesn't give you the impure sample, how do you know how much impurity there is? They must provide that to you. So when you get two numbers, I need you to think about it this way. The mass of the impure mixture, sorry, I'm going to use a different color. The mass of my impure mixture should strictly only be used. Oh my God, I, I erased away the word impure. Okay, the impure mixture will be provided by the question. Okay, so over here, take note, this 900 gram is your impure mixture. You do not use the 900 gram until your final step. So your fourth step, right, you're supposed to do starting with the 102 gram. Using the 102 gram, you work backwards to find out how much SNO2 was pure SNO2. In the last step, then you divide it by 900. Repeat one more time, huh? you will always be given two values. In your head, you must tell yourself, this two value, I only use one of it to calculate. The other one, I'm supposed to reserve it for the last step. The mass of the impure mixture is strictly used in the final step only. You should not be touching 900 at all in your four steps. Only in the final part. Okay, now, I'm going to show you the full thing, then maybe it'll, be look, it'll look a bit clearer. So in step two, you guys already know this, we'll find more. More of what thing? More of teen law. So how to find more? We will take mass divided by MR. The mass here is 102 gram. My MR of tin is 119. You can check your periodic table, no problem. But you realize I didn't type my calculator, right? Why? Because the question is in fraction. So we're going to leave it in fraction. Not a problem at all. Do you also remember what is step three? Very good, more ratio. And just to reiterate, uh, more ratio of what? More ratio of what I have found in tin with what I want to find. Sorry, tin is not TN, it's SN. So what is it that I want to find, people? Anybody knows online or in person here? Yeah, 102, I find the app more of tin. But what am I trying to solve for? What is the question asking me to solve? Percentage purity of tin oxide. I have found tin, but what I really want to find out is how much tin oxide there is. So when we go back to the equation, we can see that the more ratio here is 1 is to 1. This means that if I have 102 over 119 more of tin, how many more of tin oxide should I have? The same amount. Of. So down here is also 102 over 119. Almost there, almost there. Step four. We need to find the mass of SNO2. To find mass, the formula to use is more times MR. Okay, the number of mole here is 102 over 119. The MR is 151. Am I going to type calculator? No, uh, I leave it in fraction. I'm almost done. Almost. Because if the question asks me to find the mass of uh, thing oxide, I'm done. But this question, unfortunately, is percentage purity. So how do we then proceed to the final step? This number that I have here is the mass of my pure substance. This one here is pure tin oxide. I have the mass of my impure mixture. So to put it all together, to solve for my percentage purity, I need to take this mass, which is 102 over 119 times 151, divided by my impure mixture, the 900 gram, times 100%. If I rewrite this fraction, 
it will be 102 over 119 times 151 divided by 900 times 100%. Hard, it's hard, guys. I'm not saying it's easy. This is quite hard. But I guess what I'm trying to impress upon you is that there's no running away from your four steps. The earlier you get it, the easier your life gets down the line. Because for me, whatever you're learning learning and tested for in sec three end of year is insignificant because at the end of the day, you're taking O-levels. So what matters is that by the time you hit O-levels, you get this. So at sec three, you might still be struggling a little bit, but you cannot be in be denial that I, this one I don't need to learn, I just skip. No, cannot. This has to be the way forward, the four steps. Okay, if you trust me on this, more concept will become one of your strongest topics. But it comes with practice, okay? You come here, learn three questions, you think you're an expert, no, lah. That, that's a lie. But the four steps are always there. Okay? So I'm not too sure how your school teachers are teaching you, but this is the most efficient way of solving things really. Okay? And once you get it, you will get it forever. All good with question three. Still alive, ah? Okay. I cannot afford to stay too long. I'm going to try to go through one more question in more concept. After that, I want to move on to acid bases really. But this one, the good news is that I purposely included more questions for you all to try. Even the open-ended ones. And you have the answer sheet as well. So you can go and practice and you can check the answer sheet to see if you can solve it. Those will be really helpful. But the last question that I want to talk about is actually part C. Because I talk about, you know, 70% of questions is the four step. Then we had the limiting access. The final one that they can test you is the empirical formula. Now, here's the thing. Uh, empirical formula, you are supposed to draw the table as you're working. You're supposed to. Now, I know some of you like me, that kind anyhow, right? And you draw like tic-tac-toe. That's fine also. You don't need to take out ruler, draw nice, nice. But the working is the table. So I'm telling you, you need the table. All right? Now, how does the table work? But before we even go there, what the hell is empirical formula? Okay, very simple. Simplest ratio. So in this compound, I have Na, I have H, I have C, I have O. What is the simplest ratio of each? I, in this question, since you already see the answer, I have 1 Na, four hydrogen, one carbon, one oxygen. So the simplest ratio is like uh, two, four, one, one. Okay, sorry, I think this is a typo, right? Wait, uh, let me quickly correct this. Nitrogen. So this is not Na, this is N2. So you can go and update it a little bit. I think this is a minor typo here. It's N2. So for each compound, I have two nitrogen, one hydrogen, sorry, four hydrogen, one carbon, one oxygen. It's a bit like you order Thai fat, you know what I mean? <laughs> You want to get the rice, right? So you got four hydrogen, uh, that's your rice. Then you add two meat, uh, then it's like two nitrogen. Then you got one veggie and one uh, egg. Uh. So you get it simplest ratio, there's one set. You can order multiple of it, right? You can order multiple sets. But the simplest ratio of one base meal is a ratio of 2, 4, 1, 1. But how do we get this ratio of 2, 4, 1, 1? Firstly, you write down all of the respective elements that are present. Nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. They were so kind to tell you the percentages even, right? Nitrogen is 46.7. Hydrogen is 6.7. Carbon is 20. Then how to get this? They didn't give me it. Where did this number pop up from? Exactly. The whole thing is 100%. Ma. So you take 100 minus 46.7, minus 6.7, minus 20. What you get is 26.6. Okay, so how we get this value, you are expected to calculate it at times. So you just need to minus, minus, minus 26.6. But this is mass. This is not yet more ratio. How to turn mass to more people? What's the formula? More is equals to mass over MR. So to turn mass to more, we need to divide by MR. You get me? After that, it's just very fun already. This is 3.3. 3. This is 6.7 oh, times 2 or 1 another law. 1.67 times 2 is 3.3. 3. Mathematically, you can divide by the smallest numbers. That is how you get 2, 4, 1, 1. So if it's the smallest number already, it's just a factor of 1. You take 3.3 3 divided by this, you get 2. 6.7 divided by this, you get 4. Take note, uh, the number will not be exact. 3.99 is 4. Okay, 3.98 is still 4. You need to round up and round down a bit. You will not get a perfect whole number here. 
Okay, that is how you get empirical formula. Just remember, empirical formula, we always think simplest ratio. Just remember my Cai Fan example, you will find. But you can upsize, right? So instead of four portions of rice, you can ask for eight portions. Huh? But then the ratio is still the same, right? That means you just make it a bigger meal. Okay, or McDonald's you buy, it's always one burger, one fry, one drink, huh? right? But you can upsize that. You have more, but the simplest ratio is still the same. So this is empirical formula. So I only had time to go through two four-step fashion, one limiting reactant, and one empirical formula. But this is pretty much all you need in the exam. But trust me, if you practice, you can get really good at more concept. Okay? And I recommend if you want to practice this, right? Let's say you're a bit hardcore. Today, you were like, well, I inspired. And go back and do more concept. Uh, you do your TYS topical for more. The MCQ will do. If you can even do the MCQ alone, sec 3, end of year, you have no problem. With. Okay? So I hope that you guys uh, remember the four steps. Remember how we apply the formulas. Don't be the one to go and memorize formula and enter exam. Trust me, you memorize formula and enter exam, you can't solve shit. You will still get zero mark. You still need the formula, but you need to be able to solve questions. So more concept is about practice. Full stop. I'm good. Okay, shall we move on from more? Okay, because we still got a couple of other chapters. Okay, there's um the next chapter we're looking at is acid and bases. Okay, acid bases a bit more chill lah. Okay, I think a lot of this you might know. Uh, you probably already know this. Let me emphasize on a few key concepts we need to know. This one most likely will be tested in end of year. What's the difference between strong and weak acid? So highlight for me the keywords: strong acid, fully dissociate. Weak acid, partially dissociate. You can replace the word dissociate with ionize, but you cannot use the word dissolve. Dissolve is solid turned into liquid state. The acid here is already in liquid state. So you do not use the word dissolve. The word dissociate and ionize has the understanding that this is my thingy, it turned into two ions. So ionize and dissociate are accurate keywords. Dissolve is wrong. You will be given bang. Okay? So don't write the wrong word. Or if you want to just follow the notes, just freaking use dissociate. Okay? So strong and weak acid. Here's my favorite question. How many strong acids do you need to know? Exactly three. O level syllabus has only three strong acid. Anything outside of this tree? Weak. Let's try it. I crowdsourced the answer. What I did. I hear a HCl. Fantastic. H2SO4, last one, HNO3, nitric acid. These are strictly your three strong acids that you need to know and you will be seeing them a lot. This one will directly impact your next chapter in salts because acid, bases, salts, and QA is one big topic. Broken down so it's easier to learn, but all of them are interrelated and I'll show you how they are related later. So these three acids must know. Uh, you'll be using them like crazy until O level. Okay? Is you you might ask me, journey to memorize the formula? Yes, because uh, you'll be using it so much, you might as well know the formulas. Okay? But after a while you get it. Uh, I don't think this is something you lose sleep over. Now, more importantly, what are the three chemical reactions? This you must know definitely by end of year. There's no running away. Acid metal, acid base, acid carbonate. Okay, uh, I'm going to use my notes because I think that one's a bit more detailed. But you guys can refer to the worksheet as well. It's just as correct. Because the notes have a little bit more example to work from. Uh, let me check the contents page. I forgot which page exactly is on. Uh, 62. So here I'm talking about these three exact chemical reactions. For an acid metal reaction, you get salt plus hydrogen gas. So acid with a reactive metal gives you salt and hydrogen gas. Salt is just metal and another anion. That's all. Cation, anion, it forms a salt. Later in the chapter in salts, we talk a little bit more. But you need to know that this is the reaction. But let me caveat, uh, there's one very important part to mention here. Do all metals react with acid? Not all, right? Can you name me perhaps one example of an unreactive metal? Yeah. Copper. 
Lead is still considered reactive, but I know where you're coming from. Later, we talk about it. Uh, because there's insoluble salt that can form. Other than copper, what's another quite common one? Gold, silver. Just remember, Olympic medal got what? Got gold, silver, bronze. Bronze is an alloy made of co uh, copper. So your three medals, right? Imagine you uh, win so hard, get Olympic medal, draw into acid, it dissolves, cannot be lung, right? So I always remember it this way. Your three Olympic medals are those that are unreactive. The most common one they will throw in your face to trick you uh, is copper. So in your exam, confirm got one option, right? Copper metal react with acid, give you salt plus water. Then everybody choose their uncorrect, ma, acid metal. No, uh, copper is unreactive. And this will be one of the biggest tricky pitfalls you will fall into. So absorb this. Remember this. If I see copper, my goose bump into stems. Like, oh, shit, this guy doesn't react with acid. Okay? But let me be clear. Copper metal doesn't react. But can copper oxide react? Is copper oxide and copper metal the same thing? Different, huh? So copper oxide or copper hydroxide, these are what we call base. Acid base, you can react an acid with copper oxide and copper hydroxide. It's copper metal that's unreactive. So you don't get confused here. Now, a reasonable follow-up question that you guys should be thinking of is, so, okay, I get it, but what is the base, right? Like, what the hell is the base, right? So, let's talk about what is a base before we come back to this equation. Let me go to another page first. I really like this page, okay? But the official definition for a base, simplify for you, huh? something that reacts with acid huh? to neutralize, to form salt and water. So, if acid is something which you are quite comfortable with, Base is the other counterpart. So acid and base are like enemies. They always neutralize each other. Okay, so what exactly is a base? As you can see here, bases are oxides and hydroxides of metal. So the example I gave you just now was copper oxide. Right? It's metal oxide. You can also have metal hydroxide. Name me another random metal. Zinc is it? We just use zinc, okay? Zinc oxide, zinc hydroxide. Not the perfect example because amphoteric, but we'll talk about that later. So I'm just telling you uh, not to mess your up or anything. Base is just metal, you plus one O, or metal, you plus OH. That is base already. That will react with your acid. Okay, but here is the part where it gets a little bit more confusing. When I suddenly throw in the word alkaline, yeah, like, Okay, base and alkaline are they the same thing? Not exactly. The way I like to look at it is that base is a very broad umbrella. There's a lot of bases here. Because you randomly plug any metal, uh, you put oxygen, base there. You plug a metal, you put OH, base. But alkaline is a very special unique group. Why? Because it is only the alkalines that are soluble in water. I like to give this example. In the Navy, right? I know you all don't go surf, lah, but in the Navy, got a lot of people, right? But only a very small elite group are what they call the divers, right? So there might be a lot of base, right? Naval base, right? There's a lot of soldiers in the, the port. But there's only a very small group that's capable of diving and infiltrating. It's like the commandos, if you think about it that way, the special elites. So alkaline is just a very small group. In math, we call it a subset. It's just a small part of that group. Okay? So not all bases are alkaline, but all alkaline are bases. I repeat all the time, huh? not all bases are alkaline. Because some bases are insoluble. They are just base. But if you are alkaline, you're definitely a base. Because if you are alkaline, you're part of the family, lah, so you're considered a base, but you're more elite in that sense. Now, which are the alkalines you need to know? Very simple. If you are group one, or some group 2 like calcium and barium, you are soluble, you are an alkaline. So in summary, what is the base? Metal oxide, metal hydroxide. But some of these metal oxides and hydroxides are soluble. We call them alkaline. Okay? So I hope this is clear, all right, that you guys understand the slight difference between base and alkaline. But the good news is that both of them will react with acid. Now, if we go back to the notes, remember just now the reason why we're talking about it is because it's an acid reaction. 
So acid base, this reaction is known as a neutralization reaction. This one you probably know, not a problem. Okay, but when we use the word base here, it could be any metal oxide or metal hydroxide. So this is neutralization. Acid can definitely neutralize with alkaline as well, since alkaline is considered a base. So, so far I got two things, huh? acid metal. Take note of copper. Acid base, the difference between base and alkaline. Lastly, acid carbonate. It gives us three things. It gives us salt, water, and carbon dioxide. Yes, three. Huh? So this is the only one that produces three things. Now, how do we test for carbon dioxide? Yes. Bubble into one thing. Lime water. Then what do we get? Can you say uh, it turns cloudy? Cannot. That's a primary school answer. Now at upper sec, you only can write white precipitate. Okay? So uh, when you bubble into lime water, you get a white precipitate. That's how you test for carbon dioxide. Okay? It's part of QA. Huh? So later, you're supposed to know how to test for your gases. The white precipitate that forms is calcium carbonate. Okay, lime water is calcium hydroxide. Okay, but this one, I won't say is the key focus. But understand this, uh, if you're going to take your end of year exam, there's no way you can take the exam without knowing this three acid reaction. Acid metal, acid base, acid carbonate. You will directly use this in your salt preparation later. Okay, you're killing yourself if you don't know this three. This is foundational. Okay, so I go back to the notes now. These are the three reactions you must know. The notes are a lot more summarized, it's straight to the point, okay? But sometimes I'll use my textbook curated notes to explain because like, it has a bit more detail. Down here also outline the difference between your base and your alkaline. Okay, now, the underrated one uh, is that the truth is most people that got study a bit uh, know the three reactions for acid. But the one that people tend to forget is the two reaction for alkaline. If you want to take me seriously, you put a triple asterisk for this one. Acid, alkaline, I don't need to explain. Neutralization, you can do it. It is the second reaction that is a problem. So take a moment to look at it. Alkaline plus ammonium salt to give you salt, water, and nitrogen gas. First question, do you even know what the hell is ammonium? And what? What's the charge? No. Plus. So ammonium, you all write down for me, huh? is NH4 plus. Hey, right, chill. What is an uh, ammonium salt? Remember, salt is just like an ionic compound. So you add a uh, plus with a minus salt. So I give you all some examples of an uh, ammonium salt. You can put NH4 with Cl. This is ammonium chloride. If I put NH4 with NO3, what do I call this? Ammonium nitrate. I can even have NH4 bracket to SO4. This is ammonium sulfate. So anything that has NH4, if you react it with alkaline, it will give you salt, water, and ammonia gas. And this guy is quite important. Ammonia gas, litmus paper. What color change? Red to blue. In fact, ammonia gas is the only alkaline gas in O level. So you know the thing that can turn into blue? Only ammonia gas, huh? Acid got a few, right? That one, I don't want to talk about it. But if you are turning anything blue, it's usually ammonia gas, really. Like 99% of the time. Unless they create some new question that I've never seen before, right? In my nine years, no. It's always this ammonia gas. Okay? So ammonia gas is quite important. You guys need to be familiar with it. But I'm telling you that this one here is the most underrated one. And I'm immediately going to share with you what is the most commonly tested question related to this example. Because you know the equation is one thing, but can you solve the question? That's another thing. Okay, so let me show you the question actually. This one. Question three. Okay, before I go on to question three, uh, let me run through with a work example with you first. Then we solve question three together. It makes more sense. Wait, ah. Uh. I give you all one minute to read through the example and the answer, then I explain it to you fully.
my dream is to be a farmer. <laughs> then we all heard of this game called Stardew Valley before. I love it. I, I spent like 200 hours. It's basically a game where you are like a farmer. La. It's going to like plant my crops, going to harvest my tomato. I'm so happy. Yeah. I played it so much during the COVID part. Another 30 seconds, then let's talk about it. Okay, don't, don't judge my life aspiration. My goal is to go to Japan and be a farmer. Hey, that's me, man. That's my dream. You can't judge me for my dream. Okay, so let's talk about this example itself. This is a very common question. It can either appear in structured or MCQ. So here is like almost like structured. Then later, the example we're talking about is MCQ. Lah. So what exactly is going on? Now, as a farmer, right, if I want my crops to grow well, I usually add two things to the soil. I will add fertilizer. But to be very precise, right, what in the fertilizer is needed? I need the nitrogen content. Plants need nitrogen to grow well. So inside my fertilizer, it's quite typical for me to see the presence of ammonium because ammonium contains nitrogen. So my goal is that when I put the fertilizer, that nitrogen content can go into the soil. Then my plants can grow better. Okay, that's number one. Sometimes the soil gets too acidic because maybe acid rain or pollution or whatever, right? The soil is too acidic. The plants don't grow well when it's acidic. Some plants grow better when it's alkaline. So what farmers like to do as well is to turn the soil a little bit slightly alkaline, maybe like 7.4 or 8. So they also add alkaline to get rid of the acidity. You know, sometimes when you go to like the level, because I stay Ishuna, then you know got level 1, then the auntie uncle love to grow the plant kind. Then you'll see the bottles of water they buy, they don't just add water, they actually add alkaline water to make the soil slightly more favorable for growth. Right, okay. But the main thing here is that soil, if it's 7.4, is usually best for most plants to grow well. So farmers do add a little bit of alkaline to make the soil more optimal. But there's a problem if you add both of them at the same time. You can add one, then after that you add another. But if you sum both at the same time, it's going to be a problem. Why? Let's go back to the equation over here. The triple asterisk one. What's the problem if you add alkaline and ammonium salt at the same time? It will react. So what happens when it reacts? It gives you three things. Going back to the question now, if you add alkaline and ammonium salt at the same time, now the two will react. The nitrogen, instead of going into the soil, now it escapes as ammonia gas. Have you all smelled ammonia gas in a lab before? I'm smelly. There was once I was then blur. Like, I see like got nothing. Then I went to smell. I put my nose directly over the test tube. It shot up my nose. The whole day I could not smell anything. So don't be like me. You're supposed to hold the test tube with the thingy. Then you, you like that. You don't like, hey, cannot, cannot. that's not how it's supposed to work. Okay. So ammonia gas is damn smelly. So if you really added nitrogen and alkaline at the same time, your whole farm just smells like ammonia. The ammonia, instead of going into the soil, goes into the atmosphere. Gone. So the plants don't get any nutrients. The nitrogen is all gone. What's the worst part? The alkaline was supposed to neutralize but the acid, right? Now you go and react with the freaking fertilizer, then the acid just do that. So basically, you just added two things and they react with each other and it's gone. So that's the reason why we should not add the fertilizer and the alkaline at the same time. And this is the most commonly tested question in relation to the equation that we just done. Okay, so you can never answer this question unless you know the equation. The equation, how they'll test it, is with this. So it's this, that, that, this. Uh. So you, I hope you get what I'm trying to say here. This is how it will be tested. So now we have a chance. Let's go over to the question in the MCQ. This is in your worksheet, uh, question three. A farmer spreads ammonium nitrate for everybody's sake, let's write down NH4 and O3. Ammonium nitrate. Calcium hydroxide, in case you don't recognize, is your alkaline. Jala already, right? You add ammonium salt plus alkaline. They will react. Okay? So what will happen is that the hydroxide ions, which belong to your alkaline, calcium hydroxide, can dissociate in water to form OH-. This will react with the ammonium ions, which is NH4+, to produce ammonia gas. Let this sink in and digest the statement. 
why shouldn't we add alkaline and fertilizer at the same time? It's because the alkaline will react with the ammonium to produce salt, water, and ammonia gas. The loss of nitrogen is because now the nitrogen has escaped in the form of ammonia gas. And not just concept, uh, concept application. I'm not a god, I can't predict, I can't predict whether you'll appear in your end of year. But if it does, you at least promise me you know what is happening. Okay? That's why we put a triple extra there. But it's quite a common question. You can text me uh, after that if it really comes out in your end of year. Usually it does. Uh. Like maybe about 50% of schools will set this if they even know what they're doing. Because uh. most students don't know how to do this. Uh. Okay? If you knew how to do this, great. Now you know. Okay? So that is one of the key aspects of this chapter. All good? Can I? Okay. Let me uh, sift through to see what other is important. Uh, Let me double check. Okay, got it. Uh, the next question that I think we can try to do together is question one here. This one is not difficult, but let me just ask you a simple question. If I increase the pH, am I acid or alkaline? Alkaline, right? I didn't teach you all the pH 1 to 4. I expect you all to know at basic. Lah. So if that's the case, increase the pH, meaning we're dealing with a alkaline. My question to you is, are you able to identify which of this is an alkaline? Which one? You realize you might struggle a little bit, right? Some of you, I do think you know the answer, right? Not, not to discredit any of you. I think some of you already have the answer, right? Correct? But how to solve this question? You will need a deeper understanding of what I call your four oxides. So I'm telling you this is the question. Huh? With the knowledge, let's try to come back again. These are your four oxides. Basic, acidic, amphoteric, and neutral. Now, we start with basic first. Do you want to guess another name we call basic oxide? Sounds familiar? Basic oxide is your base. That same base that we were talking about earlier. The one where some are insoluble, but the rest are alkaline. That one, that base. So basic oxide and base is the same thing. Metal oxides are bases. Give you a few examples. MgO, CuO, Fe2O3. Basically, you take a metal, you just sum it together with an oxygen on base already. And this guy reacts with the acid. Lah. So metal oxides are basic oxides. Okay, right. Now, then you flip it a bit. Uh, if metal oxide is basic, what is acidic? Non-metal. Right? So what non-metal oxides do we know of typically? Non-metal. Carbon is a non-metal. We add oxygen. Acidic already. Nitrogen is non-metal. Acidic. Sulfur is non-metal. I add oxygen. Acidic. So a non-metal oxide is acidic. But here's the magic about chemistry. It is never that clear cut. You got basic, you got acidic. There are some uh, that decide to be in the middle. They are called amphoteric. Amphoteric is a more unique case. They can react with both acid and base. So amphoteric is sort of like a hybrid between basic and acidic. And there's exactly three of them. And let me just warn you, uh, these three will appear again later when we discuss QA. And I'll show you why you need them. But for now, just take note. I always call them the Z. Zinc, aluminium, P is what? PB. Lead. Z. Okay? Now, so I like to teach a bit of nonsense because uh, I need to entertain myself a bit. How to remember neutral oxide? Okay, imagine. Uh, I play forward, I play already. Wow, then fire. I'm going to refill my bottle. I go to the water cooler, right? I want to get neutral, uh, pH 7 water. I open the I open the water cooler, I try to refill. There is no cold water. No cold water. Neutral. Hey, you laugh, right? But you will use this in exam, okay? So just remember, got water cooler, then you go there, then there's no cold water. Neutral. Okay, but, but that's how I like to entertain myself a bit, okay? 
Do you get it? No cold water. So these are your three neutral oxides. Neutral means you get it like they don't react with either acid or alkali. But you will find that this one fuels okay, nitrogen monoxide, carbon monoxide, water like dra, like the right. You already know this. But now let's quickly take a look at question one. How is it applicable? Do you all recognize carbon monoxide now? Carbon monoxide is what? Neutral, right? So would it increase the pH? No. Lead oxide. Can you tell me what is it? It's amphoteric. Huh? Potassium oxide. Basic. Silicon dioxide. Acidic. Because huh? it's a non-metal oxide. So the two options that we should eliminate straight away is A and B. Because amphoteric does react with water. But the slight difference here is that it reacts with water, it doesn't increase the pH. Let me be very clear here. If I increase the pH, I need to release OH-. Without releasing OH-, I will not turn it alkaline. Reverse it a bit. How to turn it acidic? H+. Plus. Correct. H plus acidic, OH minus, alkaline. So if I want to increase the pH, I need it to be an alkaline. In other words, it needs to be a soluble base. Group 1, they are always soluble base. Okay? Yes, alkaline are bases that dissolve in water, group 1, and some group 2 like barium and calcium. Okay? Amphoteric is because of their position in the periodic table. They are found between the metals and non-metals. But sorry, I can't go into detail here. Lah. But if you go and find where aluminum, zinc, and lead is located, they are somewhere in the gray area. We usually call them metalloids. Okay? But this is just to address the question given. Okay, So let's summarize what is truly important about acid bases in terms of key concepts. Strong and weak. Dissolve, dissociate, fully dissociate partially. The three acid reaction, the two alkaline reaction. And lastly, your four oxides. If you have all these concepts somewhere in your bag, you are fine. You are good to go. Okay? So those are the key concepts in acid bases. Uh, I would have loved to give you all a break. Okay, I just continue. Ah, you are fine. Okay, we continue, continue. I want to make the most out of your two hours. Okay, so let's move on to salts. This is where it gets fun for me. Okay, so for salts, right, there's no running away. You need to know your salt solubility. That's it. That's, that's, that's life, guys. But like I said, I'm a huge believer of not having to memorize too much. So let me entertain you all with a bit of nonsense on how to memorize this. That, that's how I like to teach, okay? Boring stuff, we add a bit of spice to it. But it is inevitable. You need to run. You cannot run away from memorizing what salts are soluble and what salts are insoluble. Let me tell you why you need to know this. Later on, as you study your three different salt preparation methods, you need to have three, huh? we're going to talk about all three. You need to know whether the salt is soluble or insoluble. Otherwise, you cannot determine the correct method to use. You get what I mean? So without knowing your salt solubility table, you cannot choose the correct method. You cannot choose the correct method means you can't do the chapter already. So to start off this chapter, you must first know your solubility table. But there's an easy way to group this such that you only need to memorize a little bit. And even that, I'll teach you how to memorize. The one that I think a lot of your schools will have taught is the SPA. Basically, anything with sodium, potassium, or ammonium, don't need to think, huh? straight away soluble. Later, I'll teach you as well that the moment is SPA, the salt preparation method is titration. Okay, but we can talk about that later. Just remember, the moment you see SPA, straight away soluble. The, some schools like to teach instead of spa, they like to use the word span. Because the truth is that all nitrates are soluble. You can do copper nitrate, lead nitrate, aluminum nitrate, whatever thing with a nitrate conform soluble. So there's not much to memorize here. You just need to know spa and nitrates are all soluble. And in contrast, right, if you look at carbonate, uh, so this one, uh, all carbonates are insoluble, except for who? Except for spa. Work. So if you're asking me honestly, so far, nothing to memorize, right? Spa is all soluble. Nitrate, all soluble. Carbonate, all insoluble. 
except for Spark. The one where it gets us is that there is this five buggers where we need to know. These are the five that will be annoying. And these are the exact five you need to memorize. But let me give you an easier way out here. So for chlorides and sulfates, most of them are soluble, right? All are soluble, except for this five. And this five will play a super important role even in QA. So you have to listen up. You have to know them by heart. Now I want to talk about sulfate first. That's, it's always easier with me. Let, me. let me tell you how. Right? I always use the same thing. Oh no, don't draw on the screen. Oh, thanks for erasing. Okay, sulfate, this is how I remember. I think science. Asthma. What are your three sciences? Bio, chem, physics. Magic. You tell me an exam, you cannot remember biochem physics. Cannot be, right? So this is what I mean that it's a fail-safe. Like, yes, you can memorize barium calcium lead. But if you ask me, I'd rather go into the exam. Huh? Sulfate, ah? sulfate, shit, shit, shit. Or science. Or chem biophysics. C or calcium. B, B, barium. P, 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 B, lead. Done radio. It's just making life easier for yourself. You get what I mean? All right. So I'm okay if you memorize. Because some of your memory is really good, right? You can just memorize straight up. That's perfectly fine. But for me, I always like to make sure that even if you don't want to hardcore memorize, there's a way out. So I prefer to look at it this way. Lah. Now for C, right, I don't have very uh, good one. There's a few variations. Lah. But personally, right, uh, I'll just go with C. I just think about C as my Chinese. Because I take Chinese, lah, okay? I just say I'm Chinese, okay? So Chinese. Then I just remember this. My Chinese is appalling. You know what appalling means? Like damn lousy, la. you know, some of, your, some of you all can't even speak Chinese. Right? So I just remember AAP. Now there's different ways you can go about this. You can create your own story even. For some students, you might not want to do C, you can do POA. Why, why is POA? Principle of accounts. La. Some of you all do take the subject. There's a P and there's an A. C, I just remember counting money. That's principle of accounts law. Doesn't matter. But what I'm trying to impress upon you is that when you have something that you need to memorize and you don't feel exactly comfortable memorizing, you have to find a memorizing technique. This is what I call association. You associate it with something that you know and you memorize it from there. Because that, you will not forget. But if you hardcore memorize, you will forget. Always remember this, uh, whatever you memorize, you might forget. So don't fall in love with hardcore memorizing. It's one of the least effective way of studying. It's the lowest output one. Because uh, you download, uh, your files get corrupted in your head. Then gone already, go and exam die. So, but then if you come out with a story like the sciences, chem, biophysics, that one very hard to forget. right? After a while, you start using it. After a while, you get it. right? So study smart. Don't study hard. Okay, I, I don't study hard. I do not know. I will tell you more about my student life if I can. But I'm a lazy student. But you need to be smart about it. If you want to be lazy, you better know what are your shortcuts. Okay? So all of this, if you find that it's helpful, take it with you, use it. If it doesn't work for you, you can still find your own method. There's different ways to memorize. When I have chance to, I'll share with you more. There's storytelling, there's association, there's inverse relations, but only when I have time. So for now, I hope I shared what I needed to share with you. Baseline is simple you need to know your salt solubility table. Because if you don't, you cannot do this chapter. This chapter, there's only three things you need to know. The three salt preparation methods. What are they? Precipitation. I like to call the second one you can write down. Acid reaction. The third one is called titration. Three methods. Now, my guess is that there's a good chance that some of you do know how it works. That means you know the steps, right? If you do not know, go and refer to your notes, okay? If you have our curated notes, go and refer to it. The steps itself are very straightforward. It's listed here. Like. But today, right, I'm not going to fast over the step-by-step. Step-by-step, step, right, any school notes, you use our notes, you can go and read one. That one is very self-explanatory. Step-by-step meaning this. Step one, do what? Step two, do what? Step three, do what? Right, This method here, you see step 1, step 2, step 3. Titration, same thing, you see step 1 to step 8. This one is English, you can go and read. 
I'm not going to overly bother with this. Let me instill in you the correct mentality. Listen, uh, for sort of preparation, what you're supposed to know is when to use which method. Meaning I tell you a sort, I want this sort, which is the correct method to use. That is the most important part about understanding this chapter. So the exact steps you can go and study. It makes sense, right? But can you choose the correct method in the first place? Let me someone for your copper sulfate. Which method do I use? Okay, I throw another one. Barium sulfate, what do you do? Precipitation. So exactly, that means I throw something out. You must tell me exactly what method to use. If you can't do it, it means you haven't mastered the chapter. But let me explain to you how it can be done. It's simpler than it seems. I go over back to the notes. Huh? This three method. Hear me out. Huh? The three methods, when do we use precipitation? Freaking simple. The moment it's insoluble salt, sorry, it's, a bit, it's lagging. The moment it's an insoluble salt, precipitation, full stop. You get why you have to memorize the table now? Because if you do not know what are your insoluble salts, you cannot determine when to use precipitation. So very simple. The moment is insoluble, you use precipitation. Okay, so just now I said barium sulfate, right? Barium sulfate is insoluble. That's why I can confidently say that the correct method to use is precipitation. Now, here's the part where it gets a little bit more tricky. Okay, Cher, you say insoluble precipitation. Then soluble, eh? which method do we use? Listen up. Uh? If it's soluble, you have two choices. Either you do the acid reaction or you do titration. Let me keep this clean and clear cut. Soluble, if it's soluble, spa salt. S-P-A-R, titration. Anything else that's soluble and not spa, you do acid reaction. That, who stop? Two minutes. I repeat from the top. Uh. Insoluble, what do we use? Precipitation. Soluble, I got two options. If soluble is spa, I do titration. If it's soluble but not a spa, acid reaction. I can go a little bit deeper and I'll use some examples to substantiate, but this is the broad framework. So I do not know how your school teacher sort preparation, but this is literally what you need to know. Explain in two minutes. Of course, we need some examples to get better at it, which is why we included some questions. Okay, so let's explore using the questions to understand each method a little bit deeper. Let's start with... Question 3. Titration. We preparing what kind of salt? Soluble or insoluble? Soluble. Specifically, answer is B. Lo. SPA, right? Take note that A stands for ammonium, not aluminium. Ah. SPA. So answer here is just B. Lo. If you ask me, honestly, I think you can solve this in 10 seconds. Don't even need to think too hard. i show you another example that comes out in prelim. Ah. Question 6. This is an upgrade from the question we just did in question 3. I want you all to tell me with confidence if I'm trying to prepare sodium nitrate. Is sodium nitrate soluble? Yes. Two reasons. Number one, all nitrates are soluble. Second thing, it has freaking spa, right? It's sodium. So confirm soluble. Anyway, I kind of gave you the answer already, right? If it's spa, what's the correct method to use? Titration. Now, let me share another golden tip with you guys. Titration, 90% of the time. Uh, at sec 3, you just need to remember this. Acid plus alkaline. Now, acid plus alkaline, what does it form? Salt plus water. The salt that I'm trying to form is sodium nitrate. N A. NO3. Na. What is my alkaline that's Na? Na OH. Sodium hydroxide alkaline. NO3. What is my acid with NO3? HNO3. Answer? 
So what I'm telling you is spar salt use titration. How to do titration? Acid plus alkaline. You tell me acid bases, is it same chapter with salts? To me, it's one big chapter. Lah. Right? Because if you didn't study acid bases, how you do salts? Cannot be man. Right? So all I'm telling you is that titration is just an acid alkaline. Of course, the acid and alkaline, we can change a bit. We try out, we try out, we do some fun stuff. Okay? If I want to find potassium sulfate, this is a bonus question. I'm not related to this. Huh? Potassium sulfate, acid alkaline. Can you tell me what acid to use? Sulfuric acid, right? Remember, I told you, you need to memorize the tree. Then what alkaline do we use? Exactly. You get it? That's it. That's your titration already. You just need to choose the correct ones. Of course, you need to do the drip, 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 color change. Then, but those are what I call steps. You don't need to memorize the steps. It, it makes sense. It's logical. Sometimes you do in practical, you get it a bit better. But what I'm trying to get you to expand your horizon on is more importantly, when to be using which method and the choice of reactant that you're using. So just remember, titration is just a neutralization reaction between an acid and an alkaline. Choose the correct acid, choose the correct alkaline. Titration is simpler than it seems. Okay, so that is for titration. Huh? Let's talk about some of the other methods that you'll see as well. I go back down, go back up to the other method here. Precipitation. Okay, so precipitation we have just mentioned is to prepare an insoluble salt. Let me give everybody a chance. We can do this together. I'm just going to use a bit of empty space here. Can anybody tell me an insoluble salt? Anything. Lah. I use your example to teach. Anybody can come out at once. There's a lot. There's a few, right? Uh, insoluble. Yeah. Barium sulfate? Okay, let's go with barium sulfate then. So the question is, how do we form barium sulfate using precipitation? Precipitation, remember this uh, key thing. Huh? I always call it soluble plus soluble to give me insoluble. Soluble plus soluble to give me insoluble. The first soluble thingy must be containing barium. Barium something. The second one must be soluble with sulfate. Okay, sorry, I should underline this. Now, can anybody tell me what is a soluble barium? Like barium, what is soluble? Barium? The smartest choice, this is a life hack. Just put nitrate. Why? Because all nitrates are soluble. You don't need to go and think, why is it got any? No, just thumb the nitrate. Okay, but just be a bit careful. Lah. It should be a bracket too. Because barium is in group two, it's two plus. NO3 is minus. Then what sulfate is soluble? Sodium, right? Spa, ma, compound soluble. You can even write what? Sulfuric acid. Because all acids are compound soluble. So you can either put H2SO4 or in this case, Na2SO4. Now, let me explain to you the logic behind precipitation. It makes a lot of sense, right? This is my beaker. I throw in my reactants into the beaker. So inside my beaker, floating around, I have a barium 2+. Plus. I have a NO3 minus. I have a Na+. Plus, and I even have a SO42 minus. So these four ions are just happy, happy, floating inside the solution. Then suddenly, uh, two of them fall in love. This, this is legit what happens now. So after they fall in love, what happened? The barium is like, oh dear sulfate, let us be together and forever never apart. Then they come together, then they form a solid law. Then what do you do? You filter that shit out, the solid lah, done. You're in soluble salt. So all you're doing is you're adding it in, you let the four of them play together, then two of them come together law. You get your insoluble salt, filter it out, the residue is your insoluble salt. I don't even think you need to memorize the step. Like, what is there to memorize? Oh, you mix, precipitate form, you filter, you get the residue, like, okay, that's it. Lah. So there's really no need to memorize the steps here. This is how precipitation works. Okay, so you add two things that are soluble. Among them, two of them will fall in love. Then that is your precipitate. Area. <laughs> huh? Ken?
Okay, um, so that is precipitation. So we've gone through precipitation, how it works in theory. We went through titration, how it's acid alkaline. Let me cover the last one, which is your acid reaction. So same request, uh, assuming I want to do this acid reaction, recap again, uh, when do we use it? If we are preparing what kind of salt? Soluble, but it cannot be spa. Okay, can you all name me an example of something that is soluble, but not spa? You know, I have a prediction. Think of a uh, metal. Oh shit, I'll go guess magnesium. Normally people tell me magnesium. So let's play this magic trick. Ah, I think of magnesium, right? Ah, something like that. Okay, but anyway, uh, let's, let's try the real one, okay? So uh, soluble salt that is not spa, magnesium. Let's go with magnesium. You all prefer what? Magnesium. You want nitrate, chloride, or sulfate? I like your choice. Nitrate? We do nitrate. Ah, see how, see how easier to write. Okay, so the salt that I'm preparing is magnesium chloride. Guys, this is simpler than it seems. If my... This one is Cl, what acid do I use? If I want magnesium, I obviously react acid with metal. That acid metal gives me what? Salt plus hydrogen. I mean, yeah, we can go and balance it, sure. But what is method 2 essentially? It's just an acid reaction. Acid can react with how many things? We learned it just now. Got three, right? Acid metal, acid, base, acid, carbonate. So other than magnesium, I can also react it with magnesium oxide. This is base. This is metal. I can also react it with magnesium carbonate. Any of the three would work. Why can't I write carbonate probably? Carbon. So this method is suitable when we're producing a soluble salt. In other words, if I want something soluble, I just do acid metal, acid base, acid carbonate reaction. It's quite easy. Is that that's it? That's literally it. Okay, of course, it comes in with a little bit, right? Because we are adding excess of this, we need to filter our salt solution is soluble. So the filtrate, what do we do with it? We crystallize that. Then crystallize got all that heat, fuel, saturation, allow to cool, filter to remove, wash with distilled water, blah, blah, blah. But those are steps. Those, you'll eventually get it, right? By sec four, you take your prelim, you get it already because you keep doing it. But the more important thing is the understanding here. When do we use this method? Soluble, but non sparse salt. You use this method. Based on your salt choice, you choose the correct acid, you react it with what you want. You can choose metal, you can choose base, you can use carbonate. All three are okay. That is your acid reaction. But let me show you a bit of an interesting thing. Let's say I want to form copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is a soluble salt, by the way. So the correct method to use is acid reaction. What acid do I use? H2SO4, right? I can react it with either metal, base, or carbonate. Metal, base, carbonate. This time you're shaking your head. The rest still a bit blur. Why wrong? Correct, watcher. This one's soluble. Acid, I choose SO4. I react with metal, base, carbonate. You literally teach me this. So what's wrong with it? <laughs> What's, what's wrong? Did we talk about it? You get it? So I'm telling you, uh, that copper, remember I said copper, what happened? Goosebump needs to stand, right? If your goosebump got stand, meaning you got the spidey senses already. Okay, if your goosebump didn't stand, try to make it stand now. Yeah, okay? Because the moment you see copper, just remember, I need to be extra cautious. So what kind of question do you think they will set? I want to prepare copper sulfate. MCQ option one. A, they always put it as option A, right? They will do acid plus copper metal. And how many of you blur blur will just jump into the fire pit? Yay, acid metal. Yes, correct. Wrong lah. Okay, because copper is an unreactive metal. So I'm telling you where you are making the mistake, ah, so you don't go and make the mistake. Okay, but can we still use this method? Can, but you have to react it with either the base or the carbonate. You all get it? 
So yes, it's easy, it's straightforward, but there are certain tricky parts we need to look out for. Okay, so in summary for salts, what is it that we need to learn? We need to learn the salt solubility table first so that we know what is soluble, what's insoluble. Then we talk about the three methods. The most important takeaway today is you need to know when to be using which method. That means when do I use titration, when I precipitation, when I do acid reaction. If you can tell me that with confidence, then you're good to go. Let's bomb up a few. Lah. You guys see if you can get it. Okay, I'm going to write down five salts. I'm going to give you one and a half minute. You see if you can find the correct answer. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. Huh? You tell me what's the correct method for each. Okay, I'll give you all one minute, figure it out. Hey, sorry, Chad, I cannot respond to a lot of the questions, but I think a lot of you are getting it. And thanks for helping each other out. Okay. Uh, it should be MG bracket OH2. Okay. Uh, let me write that down uh, for those who are confused. This one. Okay, but thanks for asking questions. I'll still try to see the chat as best as I can, but also understand that I cannot reply to everything because uh, I need to be teaching. Okay, come. NA2SO4. What's the correct method to be using? Why? Why is it titration? Spa. That's it. Sodium. So correct method is titration. Let me push you one step further. What are the reactants to be using? Na, I use Na. Titration is acid alkaline. Na, OH. NaCl is a salt, so it's not alkaline. Alkaline is the one with OH. SO4, we use H2SO4. Magnesium nitrate, is it soluble? All nitrates are soluble. Huh? So if it's soluble, is it a spa salt? So what do we do to prepare magnesium nitrate? Acid reaction, right? They don't really call it acid reaction. Sometimes they say acid plus insoluble substance, but the same thing. Huh? What acid do I use? NO3. HNO3. Then what do I react it with? We can either do metal, base, or carbonate. Lead chloride. Method. Why precipitation? It's insoluble. Huh? So here, we should be doing precipitation. Precipitation, remember, soluble plus soluble to give you insoluble. So what lead? Lead what is soluble? We always say, right, the heck is nitrate. CL, ne? right? We just pair it with a spa. La. You can even use hydrochloric acid. Also, okay, not wrong. Because acid is soluble. Lastly, silver sulfate. Which method? Acid reaction. Huh? Because it is soluble, but yet it's not a spa salt. What acid do I use? H2SO4. I react it with silver, silver oxide, and silver carbonate. Correct or wrong? Huh? Why are you wrong? Why you me? Why is it wrong? You got it. You get me? It's all coming one full circle, right? Your Olympic medals, they don't dissolve. Okay, they don't react. So silver doesn't react. I hope at least this impresses upon you the importance of knowing your insoluble salts and your unreactive metal. Okay, there's more questions for you all to practice, but I think this is your main takeaway. If you can understand what I'm saying, salt preparation is not that hard. Get it? There's nothing to memorize here. It's all understanding. Okay, 
I'm going to push on to QA. This is where it's going to push some of y'all past the brink, but let me keep this short and sweet. I'm going to show you exactly the areas where you do not need to memorize QA, but you need to listen closely. If not, you will not be able to follow. Okay, wait, let me check the contents page. QA is 9, page 90. Okay, the next part that I'm about to teach you will be a bit challenging to follow, but if you can follow, you will really take a lot away from it. Uh, it's here. Okay, people, listen up. Huh? In QA, you will see this table. Your school notes might look a little bit different, textbook a bit different, but you get this. Lah. Okay, this is the pretty much the whole QA that you need to know. First thing I need you to understand, transition methods. Do you know what they are? That whole block between group two and group three in your periodic table, those are transition metals. So transition metals refer to anything that is found. In this area over here, this one here. Okay, anything in this region is considered a transition metal as it transits from two to three, something like that. Okay, but what is more important is I need you to understand that a transition metal will produce a colored compound. So you take a look at copper or iron. These are all transition metals, which is why it comes as no surprise. What you get here is like blue color, green color, brown color, red brown. This one, the colors, you don't need to memorize. Like. You just get it eventually because you keep using it. But here's the part where it's a bit harder to memorize, whether it dissolves or not, correct? Sometimes it is insoluble in excess, Yet, sometimes it dissolves in excess. So how do we exactly remember when it's insoluble and when it dissolves in excess? Let me show you the cheat code right now. This is the secret. Do you remember last, just now we said amphoteric? What did I say? Zap. Do you remember zap? What is, what is zap? Zinc, aluminium, lead. Just remember, your amphoteric oxides will dissolve in excess. Let me explain to you the theory behind that. Okay? It's not that hard to follow. So what I have is that inside my solution, I got aluminium 3 plus ions. When I add in NaOH, yeah, so I react with NaOH, the OH is OH minus. The aluminium and the hydroxide actually come together to form a precipitate. This is literally precipitation. I'm forming an insoluble white PVT. But here's the interesting thing. What did we learn about aluminum? The oxide or hydroxide it forms is amphoteric. Amphoteric can react with both acid and alkaline. So if I continue to add in more NaOH in excess, can it react? Yes. And if it reacts, it will dissolve. In other words, to minimize the memorizing that is needed for yourself in QA, just remember this. Yes, some of it is insoluble in excess. Some of it is soluble in excess. Those that are soluble is because they are amphoteric. Because they are amphoteric, they can react. If you add in more alkaline, I react, I dissolve. So if you ask me, do we need to memorize this? I guess, but at the same time, if you understand what I'm saying, you're good to go. So that's why your amphoteric oxides plays a direct role in your understanding for QA. Because if you understand what the hell is amphoteric oxide, you will understand that they can react with alkalines. And if it reacts with alkaline, obviously it will dissolve. Yeah. Excuse me that I cannot go through in full detail because I'm running short on time. I'm running down on the clock. But let me show you two more things that I think will be helpful. Okay, This one, your school might not tell you properly. Let me go through it. There's a bit more that I'm skipping. Uh, I'm acknowledging that I can't cover the whole thing. But let me tell you the most important part. I want you all to focus on this too. Chloride and sulfate. Now, QA, you will be very tempted to just memorize. Confirm. But see this with me. Uh. Sulfate. How do I check if my solution has sulfate? Ding, 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 ding. What do I do? Is there sulfate? I'm adding in barium. Why? 
Think about it. Which chapter am I trying to draw you back to? Salts. Specifically, your insoluble salts. Sulfate, science. Chem, biophysics. B, barium. I'm trying to impress upon you that barium sulfate is an insoluble salt. So what am I trying to do here for my test for sulfate? How do I check if sulfate is present? I add in barium, right? Then the barium and the sulfate, remember, they fall in love? Then they form a white precipitate. So if there was really sulfate, I added in barium, I should see a white precipitate. You get it? So this part, need to memorize or not? Don't need. How to test for sulfate? You add in barium, la, then barium sulfate will form. Chloride, ne? how do I test for chloride? What do I add in? I add in silver nitrate. Why? I get silver chloride. Same thing, insoluble salt. In other words, what am I trying to tell you here? The test for sulfate and chloride is your salt preparation. It is your precipitation. Salt preparation, same thing. One big chapter. I hope you are getting in the big picture now. So to test for sulfate, we add in barium so that we form barium sulfate. To test for chloride, we add in silver so I can form silver chloride. This is what I mean by QA, actually don't need to memorize. Because if you understand what I was talking about earlier, this is really quite, it will make sense. Maybe it will take a bit of time, but it makes sense. Okay? So, I mean, unfortunately, I can't go through the full QA, but I at least hope I show you portions where it's possible to understand. So if your teacher in school just asks you, QA, just memorize, uh, they're talking cock. Because you, you tell me, can, do we need to just memorize? No, la, you can understand one. And with the questions, it gets even better. Okay, but I am sorry, but I need to move on to redox already. Okay, but you got answer sheet, so you can go and do your practice. Okay, I hope you understand. I want to go through as much as possible, but I think got two hours. So I got enough time. Not enough, la, okay? But um, I hope I covered the most important parts. Let me move on to the final chapter in redox. Okay, so at least we complete what we set out to achieve today. Okay, in this chapter in redox, it can simply be broken down into two words. Oxidation, reduction, done. Okay, of course, our course is not so straightforward. Lah. So how do you recognize if something is has underwent oxidation or reduction? We can observe a few possible evidence. If it gain oxygen, oxidize. If it lose oxygen, reduce. The same could be said for if I lose hydrogen or lose electron, I oxidize. If I gain hydrogen or I gain electron, I undergo reduction. Oxidation state is the most important one. Later, we will practice how to calculate oxidation state. Like I said, this one, good content to know. You can go and memorize this table. You will only truly learn until you apply and you internalize it. So I'm not a big fan of talking about this for so long. Let's talk about solving questions. That is a lot more important. So let me use a good one here as an example. Let's take a look at question three. They are saying that which pair of compounds show that the element have variable oxidation state. Now, what the hell is variable oxidation state? Variable means got a bit or a few, lah. so it can have different charges. Now, how do we go about calculating oxidation state? Let's take a look at our answer C first. I'm going to write this big, big. Lah. Fe2O3. Now, this one here is very similar to how when you did ionic bonding, how the charges work. Now, what do I mean? Fe here, technically, I do not know what's the charge. But oxygen, what's the charge usually? Oxygen is in group 6. The charge is usually minus 2. And how many oxygen do I have? There's 3 of them. Huh? So what I like to do is I like to write minus 2. And there's 3 of them. Understand that for any compound, it must always add up to 0. I got 2 iron. So I got 2 of them. Huh? What's the charge of each iron here? Mathematically, it should be plus 3. In other words, the oxidation state of my iron here is plus 3. That's all. It's like a bit of math, I guess. It's like ionic compound. All right, so we just need to make sure that the charges overall are balanced. We use another example. I mean, since we're already on it, right? The same question. FeCl2. Do you all know Cl is in which group? 
group seven, right? So what's the charge of chlorine usually? Minus one. How many chlorine do I have? Two. I only have one Fe. Uh. So what's the charge of my Fe here? Plus two. It's just making sure that it adds up to zero. So the reason why answer here is C is because the oxidation state here is plus three, down here is plus two. This is what we call a variable oxidation state. Meaning I got two different numbers for oxidation state. Okay, by safe person. <laughs> Cannot be do one question, you know how to do it. La. You need a bit of practice. La, okay? But this is just to show you the correct way to do your calculation. There's one last thing I'd like to bless you all with before we end of the session. Let's talk about oxidation and reduction, the agent itself. Okay, Oxidizing, reducing agent. There's a few you need to know, and they are all given. The color change, you can go and memorize. That one, I don't care. Right? It will come in time. You use it so often that you know it. But I want you to understand how it works. Okay, personally, right, I like to watch like more like Mission, like Mission Impossible, uh, the James Bond series. I like those kind of movies, like a lot of action one. Okay, but think about it. Uh, imagine I call myself an oxidizing agent. What's my job? What's my mission? My, my mission uh, is I want to go and oxidize somebody else. But in order to oxidize somebody else, what happens to me? I myself must reduce. I repeat all the time. I call myself an oxidizing agent. My job is I go and oxidize other people. Oxidize you. But in order to oxidize him, I must reduce. I reduce myself to oxidize you. Flip it around. I'm a reducing agent. What do I do? What do I do to you? I go and reduce you. But then to me, what will happen? I will oxidize. Huh? That's it. It's very simple theory here. So you don't have to overcomplicate oxidizing and reducing agent. So an oxidizing agent reader oxidizes another substance while it itself gets reduced. If I'm reducing agent, what do I do? Go and reduce other people. Then I myself, what happened? I get oxidized. Now, it sounds good in theory, but can we apply it to a question? Let's try. In which reaction is the underlying substance an oxidizing agent? Think through with me the logic. Huh? As an oxidizing agent, what's my mission? Go and oxidize other people. But what happened to me? I will undergo reduction. So what I am technically looking for is to look for one of the underlying stuff uh, undergoing reduction. Because if me myself get reduced, I'm behaving like an oxidizing agent. Now, Cl2 over here is an element. An element will have the oxidation state of zero. Okay, that's, that's the rule. Uh, okay, you can go and read the notes, but this is zero. FeCl3 here, what's the oxidation state of FCl? If it's part of an ionic compound, it would be minus 1. From 0 to minus 1 is a decrease in oxidation state. My charge has minus. I reduce my charge. It has underwent reduction. For me to be an oxidizing agent, I must undergo reduction. Therefore, my answer is C because the Cl itself underwent reduction, thereby making it an oxidizing agent. So remember, you identify an oxidizing agent by checking if it underwent reduction. Is, but you need to get the logic. Okay, So if I myself am an oxidizing agent, I oxidize other people, but I get reduced. So in order to check, I check if I cannot reduce. If I cannot reduce means I'm an oxidizing agent. You can flip the logic around in other ways. Okay, so the whole chapter on redox, you can think about it in a similar way to more concept. Because it's really quite a practice base because you need to do the calculation. So like I said earlier, not all of us have learned redox, nor will it be tested at end of year. But I hope this was a good introduction to it. So once again, it's not a chapter that you need to memorize. Okay, if you take chem with me, all my students, they don't memorize one. So the day before, right? Memorize maybe 10 minutes can already because it's really about understanding concepts. Okay, so next year, as you progress into SEC 4, never fall into the pitfall of thinking, I just need to memorize this chapter. In SEC 4, it gets more difficult. There are chapters like read of reaction, electrolysis, those will kill you if you try to memorize. 
Okay, so you want to make sure that for those chapters, you build a strong understanding. Okay, so spend time to understand. It will pay off in the long run. Okay, uh, I'll leave it as that for now. But I have no choice, but I need to do the ending part. So hope you guys benefited from the lesson. I hope you learned something new. Um, I know I wasn't able to go in super detail. Lah. Hey, but you, you'll be fair to me. Lah. I only had like two hours. I think I quite chung already. It was quite productive already. Okay. So you still need to do the practices. Go and download the answer sheet. I think those will really help you for your end of year. Now, I know some of you have questions about how to join and whatever for tuition if you want. If, only if you need to. Lah. But if you want and you already decided to join, you should sign up in September because there's free stuff. But let's say you want to wait for your end of year result first. It's also okay. There's actually free trial lessons. Uh, you can sign up in October and they will begin in early November. So free trial, same thing. You can come down, you sit in for a lesson. If only then you realize that, okay, I want to join, then you join. So there is no pressure. La, okay, we won't like ask you to like must join. Or, I don't really care. La. If you want to join, you will join. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it in terms of the timeline. Um, for some of you, if you can, um, do scan the QR code to give us some feedback. We are really, really very conscious of trying to make this experience a better one. So for the next event that we do, or even the upcoming sessions, we do take your feedback seriously. So if you can just give us some uh, good feedback, uh, areas that we can do better, we will, we will appreciate it. Okay? Or if you think I'm very good, you can write I do very well. Ah, then I'll be very happy. Okay, so we go and evaluate. We're like, okay, this is good. This can be better. So any of it will help. Okay, for those that came for the first time outside, you all see a column with all the other notes. Feel free to take for the other subjects as well for your end of year. So you come for chem, you can go and take for your math or whatever. Uh, you can even take a few copies for your friends if you want to. But don't take my whole stack. La. You don't take like what, 20 away. La. No, la. You take like two to three is completely fine. Okay, those online, if you want to come down to collect a physical copy of the revision kit, you totally can do so. Uh, you just need to head down to one of our branches, either at Serangoon, uh, Bukit Tima, or Marine Parade. Uh, this whole week, you can come down anywhere from, I guess, 11 a.m. to about 9 p.m. There will be people around. You can just walk in to take. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. Huh? Okay. Yes, if the carbon is above the metal, the carbon is more reactive, it can displace the metal. Hmm. Okay, so that's more or less it. So if you want a copy, come and get it. It covers everything that you'll be tested for your end of year. Lah. So you put quite a bit of effort into designing it. So if you are studying the day before exam, go and flip through this. Okay, then when you do well, you can text me like, hey. <laughs> okay, but no stress. Lah. That's about it. Okay, so for those who are here, thanks for coming down. Uh, all the best for your end of year. Bye-bye. Go home and sleep. <laughs> if you have questions, you can ask me. Uh, let me just uh, turn off the Zoom and stuff. Okay, bye everyone. The revision notes, the revision kit is only available in soft co uh, hard copy. So you have to come down to collect the hard copy. There's no soft copy. But for the worksheet, there is a soft copy.